The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Contemporary China Initiative at Cornell University. I'm pleased and proud today to introduce Darren Byler. Um, I do this alongside our co-sponsors for the evening, the Judith Rebbe Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies, the Comparative Muslim Societies Program, uh, the CAPS Program, uh, and of course the East Asia Program uh, and uh, the China team at the East Asia Program. Dr. Byler has received his PhD in anthropology in 2018, um, and since 2017, which is in, what, 24 months ago, something like that, has published four full-length journal articles, uh, a half dozen book chapters and shorter uh, academic publications. Uh, he's contributed to outlets like Foreign Policy, China File, China Channel, SubChina Magazine. He also edits um, and uh, populates the um, blog uh, livingotherwise.com about uh, life in Northwest China. Um, this is an astonishing amount of work um, that he's produced in an extremely short time under incredibly difficult conditions, and, and I'm deeply impressed by his work. Um, the work, the writing he does crisscrosses Xinjiang province um, and ranges from poetry to photography to ethnology to ethnography to politics and then back again in a, in a loop. Um, I think he's one of the most interesting and necessary scholars in China studies right now uh, and I'm really happy to have him and I hope that you are too. Let's welcome him. Well, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you all for having me here, for coming to hear this talk. I'm, a real, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, the title of my talk today is Terror Capitalism, Uyghur Reeducation and the Chinese Security Industrial Complex. Uh, this is emerging out of 24 months of ethnographic research in, in Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghur Autonomous Region in Northwest China. So terror capitalism names a new economic and political formation. Um, it's centered around uh, a nexus between private industry, higher education, uh, um, and security, police forces. Um, the goal of this formation, this complex formation, is to control and transform Uyghur society while developing new social engineering technologies. So in my talk today, I have three guiding questions, and really there are three different parts of the talk. I'm going to first talk about the context of what produced this security industrial complex, um, the drivers behind it, and then I'll talk about the goals of the complex, um, the way that they're aligning themselves, what they're trying to produce, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finally talk about the effects uh, of this conflict, thinking uh, the space, thinking about how it's affecting Uyghurs really uh, in particular. So just to get started, for those of you that don't know, China has 56 ethnic groups, according to the, the Chinese state. Um, 55 of them are mi minority. There's a majority group called the Han, and they live in this area, the darker green area. Um, this map is showing us ethno-linguistic homelands of different groups in China, and you can see just based on the colors that you see there that there's at least four major ones, and then there's some smaller ones. Um, so the, the major groups are the Han, the Han group, in terms of the land claim historically, um, and then the Tibetan group, Mongols that live up in here, and the Turkic folks that live out here. And that's really where we're going to spend most of our time today, is talking about those Turkic peoples. Um, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, Tatars, and others. Uh, the Uyghurs are the largest group in that, in that region. So who are the Uyghurs? The Uyghurs are a group of around 11 million people. Um, they're ethnically Turkic. Uh, they speak a language very similar to Uzbek almost 95% the same. Um, so you can see that there would be obviously some relations across Central Asia because of those linguistic similarities. Uh, the Uyghurs entered the historical record in the 8th century. Um, that's really when we, we saw them first emerge. Uh, and since that time, they've been indigenous to this part of China. Um, they at, at first were nomadic, and then they, they settled in this region. Uyghurs became Muslim in the 9th to 10th century, and they've been Muslim since. Um, so it, it's really become a, an essential part of who they are as people, is their Islamic identity. An important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about Uyghurs in relation to other ethnic groups is that they, like Tibetans, speak Uyghur as the, they speak a minority language as their first language. 
They also appear different from Han. They can't pass very easily as Han, um, which is one of the important things that maybe we can keep in mind as we move through the talk that makes them different from other Muslim groups in China, different from the Hui, which is a, another minority group. So Xinjiang, this Uyghur region, has become part of China in a really solid sense since 1949 when we saw large populations of people moved to this region by the state. Uh, they were trying to secure the borderland against what they saw as a, a Soviet threat. In the 1990s, we saw further waves, uh, and this was a different one because it wasn't motivated directly by the state in the same way. Instead, people were moving there for economic opportunities. They were trying to uh, gain access to natural resources, oil, natural gas, coal, um, and then also trade with Central Asia. Um, and this had a, a, a very strong effect on, on Uyghur society. When the folks arrived from other places, from Han people moving from other places, arrived in this region, they began to, to, move, to build out the hard infrastructure, the, the roads, the pipelines, um, the railroads, all of those things, as that hard infrastructure began to move the population and, 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 and really allow them to extract those natural resources. They needed those resources because China was opening up to the west and was producing much more. Uh, in the eastern part of the country, uh, industry was booming, and so they needed more natural resources, and that was one of the drivers that brought people to this region. Um, Ch this region has around 20% of China's proven oil uh, and natural gas reserves. Since that time, they've also begun industrial-scale agriculture, cotton and tomato farming in particular. Uh, it now produces around 35 to more percent of China's cotton and around 20% of the world's tomatoes. Um, so if you're eating some Heinz ketchup next time you have french fries, you have a 20% chance that the tomatoes that you're eating are coming from here. Um, people that, that live in this region, though, the Uyghurs that are native to the region, were, were largely excluded from a lot of these new industries, especially the natural resources industries. Instead, specialized workers that were sent from other places um, using kind of guanxi networks, which are uh, ne networks of relations, um, they came from local areas in other parts of China and as, a, as groups, and then worked in these new industries. Um, so although it seemed as though the economy, the shifts in the economy would help Uyghurs to integrate with the, with the rest of the country, that their, their uh, level of poverty would be in, uh, reduced, um, it, it instead had the opposite effect. Because poverty is relational, um, Although Uyghurs could continue to do the kind of farming work that they had done in the past and maybe had the same sort of subsistence style agriculture, um, the economy around them was changing. And so the prices of things, the cost of living was increasing. So the price of flour, the price of rice, all of these basic staples were becoming more expensive and Uyghurs were being excluded from that new economy. And so they found themselves becoming poorer even while they were actually kind of in the same sort of position. One of the uh, unintended consequences, or not, not necessarily thought out consequences of all of this infrastructure build out, was that they also produced, brought communications infrastructure. Um, so by 2010, uh, 3G networks had reached all of the Uyghur region. Um, by 2012, the app WeChat had arrived as well. Um, and that had a big effect on Uyghur society. Uyghurs for the first time began to by smartphones. So when I did my first year of field work in 2011, everyone was starting to buy these phones, people young to old. Um, by 2014, everyone had one, even the grandparents, and they were using WeChat to communicate with each other. WeChat was a, a major uh, innovation for them because it allowed them to use oral speech functions, uh, which previously they, they couldn't do. Uh, they, they didn't have apps that could do that kind of thing for them. Um, and oral speech was important because Many of these folks are, are not fully literate, um, and so writing speech was difficult, um, writing text was difficult, and also the, the keyboards on their phones weren't really set up for Uyghur script. Um, but the oral speech function of WeChat allowed them to speak pretty freely. Also, they knew that the government didn't have the capability to fully censor what they were saying. And so WeChat became a vibrant space for discussing politics, for discussing culture, and discussing religion. Um, they used WeChat to, to find jobs as well. And so in 2011, when I was doing that first year of field work, I saw lots of young men, mostly young men, moving from rural areas to the city to try to find work and also to find a bit more freedom. Uh, because in the countryside, religious practice was much tighter, had much tighter controls. Um, 
It's a small area, the police presence is larger. Everyone knows if you go to the mosque or not. In the city, there's more anonymity, and so people felt like there was more religious freedom in the city, and that was one of the reasons why they migrated. The primary reason, though, was, was uh, money. They needed to get into the cash economy. So on Fridays in 2014, this is what the mosque looked like. There was more people than could fit in the mosque in, in the city of Urumqi, which is the, the capital of this, this region. Um, many people were there to, to, to pray, um, but also to network with each other. Um, they thought, though, that the mosque space, even in the city, was not the space where you would find real Islam, because uh, Islamic speech was, uh, or teaching was still regulated by the state. Instead, people began to study on their own. Um, they used pens like this to learn the Quran, to, because you can scan over the text and it will teach you how to speak you, in Arabic. Uh, so they were doing that. They are also meeting in prayer room spaces around the mosque area, in restaurants, these are illegal spaces, um, to discuss Islam. Mostly what they were interested in in terms of Islam was discussing messages that they were receiving from Turkey, from Uzbekistan, from the Uyghur diaspora, um, and from the Uzbeks, uh, because Uzbek is so similar to Uyghur. Uh, they were interested in forms of Islam that were just mainstream forms of Islam, normal Muslim things, like Hanafi forms of Islam, that are basically, what is halal, what is haram, how should we pray, what does it mean to be Muslim, what does it mean to be a contemporary Muslim now? Um, most of them were not interested in political forms of Islam um, that, that you might associate with Uyghurs as, as being a, a interested in violent resistance, um, something along the lines of, of, of jihad. Uh, instead, they were interested in just what does it mean to be Muslim? The mosque space also provided uh, economic opportunities. On Fridays around the mosque, there was a large bazaar that would, would spring up. Um, people would meet to discuss where the next jobs are and also to talk about Islam. Um, they talked about putting money on their phone card as one of the most important aspects of their weekly life. If they weren't able to put money on the card, they couldn't contact their family back in their hometowns. They also couldn't find uh, jobs and they couldn't build the sort of Islamic persona that many of them were working on. They, they would post regular posts about you know, exhortations, uh, hadiths, things that you should talk about if you're a pious person. You know, it's, it's similar to what all of, or many of us might do on Facebook, where you're, you're projecting a public persona to other people. They were doing this as well. One of the young men that I spoke with, I spent a lot of time with, and I, I interviewed dozens of them, is someone I'll call Hassan. Um, he talked about himself as a pious traveler. He'd come to the city for religious reasons, but he was also a hard worker. He was 23 years old. He had a wife and small child. Uh, he prayed five times a day in a particular mosque. It's something I was also tracking is which mosques do people go to, and they were, they were really interested in ones where they had people from the same socioeconomic status, where they kind of fit in. And so Hassan had certain mosques that he fit in better than others. He believed that, that uh, drinking, smoking, movies, dancing, all of those things were haram, were, were immoral. Um, and instead, he wanted to, to practice Islam on a regular basis. Initially, when he came to the city, he sold jade, which is a resource that is native to this region. Uh, it's famous throughout China. Um, and he had mined some of this jade when he came. He sold that supply, and instead of leaving, he began to sell other things. He was hustling, which is what most of these young men were doing selling naan, and then he sold shoes, he worked in, he did demolition as a day job, he, uh, he worked as a waiter, he did a lot of, 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 of jobs. Um, he was also a prolific user of WeChat. He had over a thousand followers, which was a lot for him. He, he was proud of it. Around this time in 2014, uh, which was April and May of, this, of that year, uh, the state declared what they called the People's War on Terror. This was in response to a number of violent incidents, at attacks in, in places like Kunming um, and Beijing, and also in Urumqi, uh, where Chinese civilians, Han folks, were killed by Uyghurs. Um, it was, there was an uptick in those violent incidents. Uh, and there's many reasons, and we can go into it maybe in the Q&A, as to why those things were happening. Um, but it was... Uh, a minor aspect of people's lives, someone like Hassan, he didn't know anyone that was involved in those kind of incidents, and it seemed far from him. Um, the state, though, began to find connections or see connections between new forms of pious practice, new forms of Islamic practice, and these, the rise in these terrorist incidents. 
Um, and so they erected, put up posters that looked like this throughout the Uyghur neighborhoods of Urumqi in 2014 uh, in Hassan's neighborhood. And these are posters that tell people that you should dress in normal ways and be a beautiful person. Don't, don't wear abnormal clothing. Um, the abnormal clothing is Islamic clothing, women veiling themselves, young men having beards, um, or having any sort of Islamic symbol on their clothing. Uh, those things were outlawed, uh, and you could be detained for wearing them. Around this time, the state also began a process of moving, expelling migrants from the city, sending them back to their hometowns. And Hassan was one of the victims of this. He said, uh, this was in January of 2004, he told me, I'm being forced to go back, back to his hometown in Yaken. The Yaken police have been calling me every day, telling me that I must come back. They won't give me a reason why, uh, a reason. I don't have any choice. Someone must have accused me of something or reported something I, I said online. I don't even know what I'm accused of, but I must accept their judgment. I have no choice. Where there is no freedom, there is tension. Where there is tension, there are incidents. Where there are incidents, there are police. Where there are police, there is no freedom. So what he's describing here is sort of a cycle of violence, the cycle of oppression where um, there's an incident, then the police crack down, then people respond to that crackdown, and then it, it escalates. Um, and he said he really has no choice. He's also mentioning something there about his online behavior, and he saw that as potentially what was behind the police wanting him to come back. So a few weeks later, he went back to Yaken. Uh, and initially, he was fine. I, I even visited him in a, a nearby city. Um, but then several weeks later, the police came and took him, um, and he, he disappeared. Uh, his family lost track of him, uh, and they still haven't heard from him since. And this was over two years ago now. Um, so it's, well, three years ago. So it's, we don't know what's happened to him. It could be that he was sent into the re-education camp system, which is something I'll talk about in a minute. Or it could mean that he died in detention, he died, died in, in interrogation. Um, thousands of, of Uyghurs have died in that, in that way, have disappeared completely. Um, there's a lot of police brutality in this region, and that's actually, I think, what's the, the state violence towards Uyghurs is really at the heart of what's going on there. So I, I'm telling you Hassan's story, I know it's, it's horrific and it's horrible, as, but I'm, I'm telling you this story because it's symptomatic of something that's broader. Um, his story is not, his, is not only his, it's the story of many young men. So what are the goals of terror capitalism? So, so far we've really just talked about the context of the situation. We haven't talked about how the state was really moving towards them with technology. Um, the way that I frame this, this complex that was emerging over this period of time is that it was an analog to the global war on terror, which was originated in the United States. Um, here, though, the terrorists are not people that live in a foreign country. They're not far away from, from the state that's, that's conducting the war. Instead, they're in the country itself. Uh, the terrorists are minority Muslim populations in, in their own country. Um, they're seen, though, a, a, as, as making ex capitalist expansion more difficult and making simply the, the stability of the country uh, threatening that stability in some ways. Uh, it, this, this new form of counterterrorism uses cameras, checkpoints, prisons, internment camps, and forced labor factories rather than overt violence, as the United States has done with wars, drones, and targeted killings. Um, in both cases, though, it's enabled by a state of exception, a war space. A war is declared, and that makes, makes it clear that the normal rules don't apply. Instead, you can do kind of exceptional things. It's also an anal analog to what Naomi Klein talks about as disaster capitalism, where there's a hurricane or some natural disaster, and in response, companies can get involved in, in the cleanup of that thing. They can, they can uh, move in and make money in the chaos. Um, there's a similar kind of dynamic here. It's also tied into something that's emergent in the United States um, and the world, uh, something called surveillance capitalism, which is something that Shoshana uh, Zoboff has named recently. Here she's looking at Facebook and Google and the way that they're using all kinds of uh, devices to track our lives, from d diet apps to smart speakers. Um, all of those things that have become a part of our life. All of us probably have our smartphone with us, so Google and Facebook know where we are right now. Um, 
they're, they're using our, our human behavior to advertise to us, sell us products, and sort of shape our behavior. That's what she's arguing. This actually emerges from, from a response to 9-11, when in response to counterterrorism, to, to terrorism and, and the need for a response to that terrorism, there was a counterinsurgency narrative and theory that emerged where you need to have total knowledge of, of systems, of what people are doing. Um, in order to mitigate potential threats. Um, in the United States, there's been some restrictions on how that can be applied, um, but Edward Snowden and others have shown us that it's, those restrictions maybe aren't, aren't quite as um, uh, fully implemented as they possibly should be. In China, there's fewer restrictions on monitoring people's behavior. Terror capitalism um, works to extract value um, in this context in China, by partitioning people, s segmenting them in place, um, and then harvesting their data, the data on their behavior, and, and then automating training uh, in response to the data that's been collected. Um, it's also, in some ways, an analog to what you might think of as racial capitalism, something that Cedric uh, Robinson has talked about, um, where the dispossession, capitalist expansion, actually depends on the dispossession of minority folks, of minority others, um, taking their land in a way to, to uh, extract value. Um, there's a similar kind of dynamic here. Because the, the rhetoric of terror now is associated really only with certain folks, certain people, even in China and in the United States, it's minorities and it's Muslims that, that can, can do terror acts. Others are not really capable of it. They're not seen in the same light. That's why when we have um, a mass shooting at a school, it's not seen as terrorism necessarily in the United States. Um, but if a Muslim does the same act, then it's seen as terrorism. The same thing is happening in China. Uh, and so you can see some analogs there. There's also some differences, though, because in this case, what we're doing, what, what's going on in China, is that they're producing a kind of venture capitalism, where they're, they're investing in this, in this, in this project not for immediate returns, but because they think they'll be able to build something out of it. OK, so what exactly am I talking about? Um, you might be getting lost. Um, so terror capitalism, as I'm framing it, it really emerges post-2009 when there was large-scale violence in the city of Urumqi. Um, there, was, there was violence in the streets. And for a year, the, the, the Chinese government turned off the internet completely in the region. Then in 2010, they turned it back on, and they built out the 3G networks. Um, when it came back on, though, Facebook and Twitter were banned throughout the country. Instead, they, they replaced them with, with domestic social media. Um, since that time, the state very quickly realized that Uyghurs were using WeChat to, to build a sort of autonomy around cultural practice and religious practice. And so they wanted to break that autonomy. And so they worked in, in, in a collaboration with state security, higher education, and private industry to do that. There's now 1,400 private tech firms in this region, um, and that space has been broken. The goal behind a lot of what they're doing is to create kind of total knowledge of what Uyghurs are up to. They want to make them accessible to the state and to the vision of the state. Um, and so to do that, they need to collect data, um, biometric data, and they also need to collect qualitative data, the personal histories of people. They've also hired hundreds of thousands of people to, to, to do this work. Many of them, especially the lower level folks, are Uyghur. Uh, that they man the checkpoints uh, to access the information to make sure that people uh, are submitting their data. Um, the technology also provides a framing for investment in localities. So it's a way of bringing money to the localities. Because the state, if you say you have a terrorism problem, the state will give you money. One of the ways that they frame this the, uh, in terms of goals is that they want to both smooth out and bind certain sets of people. Um, so one of the tech spokespersons for Leon Technology, which is responsible for Kashgar City um, and building safe city projects for Kashgar, um, said that anyone who has been to Kashgar, which is a, this Uyghur city, will know that the atmosphere there was really thick and imposing. So for him, going to Kashgar felt unsafe. It felt too Uyghur. Um, but he says, through the continuous advancement of their project, we have a network of 10,000 video access points, which will generate massive amounts of video. This many images will bind many people. 
which he says is a good thing, that the Uyghurs will be bound in place. Um, he then said that we're also integrating this with AI systems so that we don't have to man the system. The system can run and learn on its own. A lot of the technology that, they, that, that you'll see if you go there looks like this. It's, if a hard infrastructure looks like this, it's, it's uh, what they call convenience police stations, which in every Uyghur neighborhood have been, have been built over the last three years, uh, four years now. Um, they're every three to 500 meters. Sometimes there's variability. Around 15 um, police officers are based at each one. They uh, are seen as r rapid response teams. Um, they also monitor cameras, um, make sure that the AI is working on those cameras at least. Um, and they conduct spot checks. So they go out into the street and they, they do kind of ethno-racial profiling and, and grab people that look suspicious and ask them for their documents, ask to look at their phones. Um, the partitioning starts with those convenience police stations, but it extends to other spaces too. At the jurisdictional level between counties, there's also checkpoints. So people that were sent back to the countryside like Hassan, if he wouldn't have been taken by the police, would have lived between two checkpoints. Most, most Uyghurs now live between checkpoints and they're not permitted to go beyond the checkpoint without special permission. This is just a mapping of some of the checkpoints along one of the routes uh, in the region. Um, checkpoints look like this. They they're look like maybe an airport or a subway station um, where there's, the difference though, it might be that there's face recognition software and, and machines that are enabled there. Um, so you, when you, you come through the machine, you have to put your ID down on the, on the sensor. It'll read the sensor and match it to your face. This is what one of the checkpoints looks like uh, that I went through in April when I was there the last time. Um, and, so, and, and I'm showing, this, showing you this so you can kind of see how this actually works in practice. Um, on the left, or on the right two sides are the, the, the lanes for local people, for, for Uyghurs. Um, and on the left, Yes, the left side uh, is the, the green lane, which is for Han people, uh, which really in this case just goes through the back gate of the, of the uh, checkpoint. So there's a police officer that opens the back gate for people that look like they are Han. Um, Uyghurs, though, have to put their ID down and have their face scanned. Uh, I wasn't sure which, which line to go through when I was there because I'm not Uyghur or Han. Um, so I was talking in Uyghur to folks in this lane and they said, well, you speak Uyghur, you could possibly be a city Uyghur because I have glasses and stuff and I don't speak Uyghur that well. Um, I mean, I don't speak like a native speaker. Um, so you should go through the Uyghur lane. So I went through the Uyghur lane and at the front I showed them my passport and then they, they actually had to take me to the police station and scan it manually. Um, and they said I, they, they were doing it for my safety. Uh, which was interesting. So at the, at the uh, hotel, there's also face scanning machines now. Um, this is at the, one of the hotels I stayed at. Uh, they told me I didn't have to use this also because I, was a, I wasn't a local. Um, but it's just a closer up so you can kind of see how the face scanning machines look, what they look like. Um, you put your ID down and it matches to your face. Um, the way that this system works, the face scanning works, is in relation to the biometric data that's been collected. So in 2017, they initiated a program, um, a new party secretary called Chen Chuanguo in, in, was behind a lot of this. Um, he, the program, which was framed as a, as a public health initiative, um, was called Physicals for All, and it required all Uyghurs all people native to the province to go to their local police station and submit bio biometric data, DNA, fingerprints, blood types. Um, they had to record something into a device, seeing, reading it over several times so they would get a unique voice signature for each individual. Um, and then they put them in front of a camera um, and had them turn to all sides, make different expressions for the camera to get a full facial scan of the person. Um, many Uyghurs said that it took over an hour to actually do that, the face scanning because he had to do it just right. It was, you know, it's very high definition. 36 million people participated in this project, which is almost twice the population of the region, which makes it, which suggests to me at least, that some people didn't do a good enough job the first time they went in and so they had to go back again. Um, but the, the fact that it was happening in the police station and that Uyghurs really had no choice but to do it shows us that it's not really a global health initiative or public health initiative. Instead, it's, it's actually a policing uh, mechanism. 
this data and other data that's being collected is now integrated in a joint operations platform across the province. Um, it's pulling together a, from a whole variety of sources information from cameras, from Wi-Fi sniffers, which grab packets of information as it moves through the Wi-Fi network, um, and your ID, your family planning history, um, your health history, all of those things. They also asked Uyghurs to install a sort of nanny app on their smartphone called Jingwang Weishi, uh, which is clean net guard or clean internet guard. Um, the app is associated with the person's ID um, and searches through your phone and all the messaging you're doing, doing on your phone to find unique identifiers of your social network. Um, so it's looking through photos, through audio recordings, texts, and videos to find out who you're talking to. Um, and then it's sending all of that information to a database uh, where it's compared against flagged individuals and speech. Um, and so if you're talking about Islam, if you're talking uh, to someone who's seen as a criminal or as an extremist, that will be flagged immediately. Um, sometimes the, the person is often alerted that you've, you've accidentally contacted someone or done something wrong, and so you should delete that content immediately. Um, if you don't, then you can be uh, detained. When I was there in April, I, I saw people doing this a lot, and so I, I would kind of hang around to kind of see how they're doing it. And then the police officers would ask people to give them the code to open their phone. So they would hand over their phone, um, and then they would scroll through it, find the app, open the app, and then make sure that it was installed correctly and that there was no flagged content that appeared there in the app. Um, you would think that one of the approaches you could have to, to stopping this from happening is you should just not carry your smartphone. But that's also seen as suspicious, especially if you're a younger person, because you should have a smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, it might mean that you're, you're doing something you're trying to hide. Um, and so instead, people just keep a very clean phone. That's what they call it. Um, so far, what I've talked about is really the, the techno side of all of this, the sort of quantitative data. But they were also collecting qualitative data. In 2017, they asked police officers in each neighborhood to go into each Uyghur home and assess people um, using 10 categories of assessment. So you'd start out with 100 points. Um, and then they're trying to decide if you should be slotted into a safe group, which is where you start out, or a normal group or an unsafe group. Um, each category that counts against you is minus 10. So if you're between the ages of 15 and 55 of military age, then you're deducted 10 points. Uh, if you're ethnic Uyghur, minus 10. If you're unemployed or underemployed, minus 10. If you possess a passport, also minus 10. And then if you pray daily, if you pray on a regular basis, minus 10 as well. Um, the big, big category that caught many people was the, the, the category associated with possessing religious knowledge. So that means unauthorized religious knowledge. Um, things you, if you had passed messages on WeChat, um, if you had downloaded messages, if you had attended one of those prayer rooms, if you had studied Arabic using one of those pens, you had unauthorized religious knowledge, and you are in a category of suspicion. Um, if you've gone to one of 26 banned countries, or like Muslim majority countries, such as Turkey or Egypt, um, that's also minus 10. If you overstay the visa, minus 10 as well. Um, if you have an immediate relative living abroad, also a problem. And if you've taught your children about Islam in your home, also minus 10. Um, so you can see that some of these categories are really basic to who you are as a person, your ethnicity, your age, uh, your employment status. Those first three apply to a broad swath of America, oh, sorry, Uyghur society. So Three of these categories, the first three are really basic to people's existence. So you can already see that people are going to be put into, an, into the normal category very fast, very quickly. So you start out with 100 points and you're a safe person. If you get minus three categories, then you're in 70%. Uh, you're entering normal territory. If you get a couple more against you, then you're in the unsafe category. And those people that were assessed as unsafe, they were the people that were sent to the re-education camps, which were being built during this period. So since 2017, around 10% of the Uyghur population, which is, I, I told you at the beginning, 11 million people, um, have been sent to internment camps for re-education. Millions more have been, been forced to attend like kind of night school or weekend school, where they get re-education too, people that are more in the normal category, not the unsafe one. They've also, the state has also sent over one million uh, kind of mid-level party officials from other parts of 
the province or the region to the Uyghur villages to monitor families, especially the families of people that have been sent to the camps. Um, so they're monitoring and assessing to make sure that they, they, they're getting all the people that are unsafe, people that are potentially extremists and terrorists. Uh, the people that have been detained have been sent first to detention centers where they're assessed further. This is what a detention center looks like. The re-education begins there already with monitors on the wall where you receive messages. Here they're listening to Xi Jinping. The detention center space is very crowded. Uh, around, in most reports that I've heard from people that have been in detention centers, around 30 people are held in each, in each cell. Uh, they sleep on a Kong, a, a platform in that space. In some, of the, in some cases, it's so crowded that people have to take turns sleeping. Uh, there's simply not enough room. The lights are never turned off in the space. There's uh, cameras and microphones in each corner of the room uh, where they're monitoring to see if anyone is speaking Uyghur, which is forbidden in this space, um, and just kind of monitoring behavior in general. Uh, there, they're, they're assessed further through interrogations. Um, and through an investigation into their background. Uh, one person that was in that space, uh, she's a Kazakhstani national who's a Uyghur eth by ethnicity, who was kind of taken accidentally, was eventually released after one year. Her name is Gulbahar Jalilova. Um, she was accused of, of wiring money to a company in Turkey that I think was assumed to be a front company for a religious organization. She's held for over a year. She said that in her cell there was at least 30 people uh, most times, um, and they ranged between the ages of 14 and 78. Uh, during the period of her detention, she lost around 70 pounds because people are given basically a starvation diet. They're given one steamed bun and some kind of watery soup three times a day, around 600 calories. Um, she observed women kind of losing it in that space, um, screaming, hitting their heads against the wall, uh, smearing feces on the wall, uh, refusing commands, um, those people disappeared. They were taken either to solitary confinement or to mental hospitals or simply vanished. Um, over the, the, the period that she was there, she, she observed this. And, and I've seen, I've interviewed other people that were also in detention and they've said similar things. So it's, it's a very tough space. It's not simply a, a school, a voc vocational school that people are, are sent to. Um, she said that people there told each other kind of in whispers that they should just pray on the inside and pray for the, the strength to survive this. Uh, Gulbahar said that in her cell, there was kind of two reasons, main reasons why people were detained. The people of her generation uh, were mostly detained because they had their, their contact information in someone else's phone, someone else that had been detained. And so that was a, a reason enough for them to be sent to the, to the detention center. Um, at least this is how she, they reported to her. She said younger people, though, were often detained for things that they had done on WeChat in the past, sometimes things that they had done over five years ago. Um, one person, a young person, told her, I deleted them a long time ago, but somehow they restored them. They were just pictures of women in veils. In one of them, a little girl is holding her hands up in prayer. Um, so it's this type of image that I'm showing you here that is enough to send someone to the detention center as an extremist. There's now around 200 camps that have been documented, uh, mostly using satellite imagery in comparison to bidding contracts for the contractors that are building these spaces. This camp is close to Urumqi, the, the capital, um, and has since doubled in size to hold around 130,000 people. That's the estimate. At least um, it has that capacity, which would mean that it's the largest prison in the world. Um, there's a, likely as many as 1,200 camps across the region. Here's a mapping of some of them. Most counties have their own camp. Inside the camp, uh, it's sort of a medium security prison where people are held in dormitory style confinement in a cell uh, that's locked at night um, and I think during the day, uh, periods of the day. Uh, people are uh, given tasks throughout the day. They wake up at 6 a.m., make their bed, go out, raise the flag, sing the national anthem, sing patriotic songs. Then they begin re-education classes, political training classes, and in some cases, Chinese language classes, because it's something that's part of this process, too, is learning Chinese. Um, this is an image from Lop County, which is close to Hoten. Those that do not perform well in, in this space um, are sent to detention uh, and, and to uh, solitary confinement. 
There's people have reported beatings and other forms of kind of psychological trauma. Uh, in the afternoons, in some cases at least, people are asked to perform kind of struggle sessions, something that's reminiscent of earlier periods in Chinese history, where people stand and confess their crime, and then other people criticize them, um, telling them, yes, you are horrible. Why did you study the Quran? Uh, you should have not done that. Most recently, over the last six months, uh, the state has begun a new project in relation to the camps where they've begun to build factories in association with the camps. Um, and so people that graduate from the camp space are moved, which is, let's see if I can get this to work. This is the prison space. Um, they might be moved across the street to work here in a factory space, that, that sort of thing. Um, in the factories, they are often learning how to do kind of regular work. Uh, like sewing garments, um, sewing, in one case, at least they've, they've been sewing college apparel for, the, for sale in the United States. Um, they're learning how to be productive members of society. The factory owners are Han, almost exclusively Han folks that are coming from other parts of the country to set up these factories. They're given incentives by the state, subsidized. The workers are subsidized. They are subsidized for the workers, uh, they, and they also don't have to pay the workers very much. Uh, it ranges, there's a range, um, but it's quite low wages. Um, and so it's an it's a internship space uh, in some ways, um, but it's also a source of cheap labor. It's also a space where Chinese is the only language that's taught. The, the factory owners are tasked with teaching the, we, the Uyghur workers to speak only in Chinese, um, and also to learn kind of basic quality uh, Sujer. They need they need the quality that they are lacking as Uyghurs, um, and by by working in this space, they'll gain some of that quality. And so, a Uyghur man that I interviewed, a businessman who knows people that are actually uh, in these camps uh, that are in some ways associated with them, their local Uyghur officials, told me that in his estimation, Uyghurs are still alive, but kind of just barely. He says, Uyghurs are alive, but their entire lives are now spent behind walls. It's like we are ghosts living in another world. So they feel bound in space. Even those that, that aren't in the camp are always fearful that they could be sent to the camp, and there's always these checkpoints everywhere they go. A Han relative, someone who is sent to live in Uyghur homes and monitor them that I interviewed in April 2018, told me a kind of opposite sort of story. He told me, I feel so much freedom now. We can go anywhere we want. And so they felt, he felt that the, the system was really empowering him and making him feel a lot safer. Um, so you can see that there's a sort of bifurcation in terms of power and who has the ability to affect others, to move and act in the world. Uyghurs that I spoke to in, in April of 2018 told me that these vans that you can see driving down the streets almost everywhere in the region are, are modes of terror. They, they, they convey kind of feelings of terror and they trigger a, a sort of anxious response. Because these are the vans that transport people to the camps. And so if you see them parking in your area, in your residential area, it could be that you're taken or that someone you know is taken. Most people have a go bag, a bag of things that they're going to need if they're taken to the camp. Um, everyone is kind of, Uyghurs at least, are often living in fear. The mosque space that was so vibrant in 2011 and 14 when I was doing my earlier research are now empty. On Fridays, there's no one entering the mosques. They're still technically open, but they have face scanning checkpoints at the front. And because going to the mosque is a sign of extremism, people have just stopped going. So to kind of circle back to the terror capitalist framework that I'm working with, um, what we've seen is that the Chinese state is using this space as a space to do a lot of things. It's an exceptional space. And one of the things that they want to do is they want to build the, the Chinese capabilities in AI research. And so by 2030, Xi Jinping has, has put, in, put together a plan that they will invest $150 billion in building that industry. Um, these companies that are pioneering this technology in Northwest China are leading the field now in a lot of this technology, especially around face recognition, voice recognition, computer vision AI. Um, when I gave a talk at Google recently, they, they said the same, that yes, China is now in, in, in the lead in some of these capabilities because we simply can't access the same kind of data that, that these companies can. Um, AI is projected to bring around $7 trillion to China by 2030 as well. So when I talked about this being sort of a venture capitalist project, 
that's the sort of outcome that they're hoping to get through it. It's not only going to come through the technology they're developing in Xinjiang, but some of it will. They're already kind of moving some of these projects elsewhere. Right? One of these companies, Cloudwalk, has recently signed an agreement with Zimbabwe to build a face recognition checkpoint system for Zimbabwe, where they'll be able to control the population in a way that's similar to what they're doing in Xinjiang. So the a Leon technology spokesperson, which is one of the big companies that's working there, said that for, from his perspective, um, there's unlimited potential for the project that they're doing. As he said, one belt, one road accounts for 60% of the global Muslim population. If those of you that don't know, one belt, one road is the new Silk Road project that's going to take China through Southeast Asia, through the Middle East to Africa, um, expanding Chinese development all along the way. Um, and so they, they see that there's a lot of potential for using this kind of technology. Um, because there's Muslims all along that, that route, they're going to need technology to control Muslims. Because Muslims are terrorists. That's the kind of one-to-one -one equation that's being made here. So what are the, the impacts? From Uyghur perspective, what's being produced through this is this feeling of kind of total unfreedom. There's no ability to move or act. Um, and in addition to that, they feel as though their institutions, the basic kind of elements of their society and their culture are being eliminated or weakened. Um, their faith, Islamic faith, their language, even their family structure is kind of being torn apart because many of these folks that are in the camps are parents of children and the children are taken, sent to orphanages and where they're, where they're, they're being taught Chinese. Um, so there's a lot of upheaval in the family structure as well. Um, Cuisine is all also under threat in some ways, the food culture. Uh, they're no longer allowed to talk about eating halal food because that's a sign of extremism. From the state perspective, what's being produced is a kind of permanent stability, a long-term security um, that will be a final answer to the Xinjiang problem or the Uyghur problem. They also, though, see uh, unlimited growth along the One Belt, One Road. Um, in terms of broader implications of this, which is how this is going to affect the world in general or human life in general, we can see that if you have kind of total knowledge or total control over human behavior, self-determination itself can be called into question. And so that's one of the major, I think, takeaways from examining this situation is that it can be replicated elsewhere. This is sort of the frontier of where we're at in terms of capitalist growth. Um, it's also producing a kind of new division of power um, where ethno-racial relations, class difference, and national difference are being hardened so that certain groups can be targeted by systems like this while others can be empowered. Their power will be extended. Um, and so it's, it's a very threatening situation for people anywhere in the world um, and something that all of us should keep an eye on. It's not simply that it's a horrific event in Uyghur society. It's, it's a massive human rights tragedy, um, but it's also something that's on the horizon for all of us. So I'll thank you. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there.